Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan, Sunday on CBS. Everyone, I'm Tanya Rivero. Thank you for joining us. We are following a developing story overseas. An Air India plane has skidded off a runway, killing the pilot. The plane from the United Arab Emirates was landing in Calicut in the southwestern part of India. Officials say the plane broke into pieces but did not catch fire. There were 191 people on board. Dozens were rushed to the hospital. Officials say the plane was trying to land during a rainstorm. We will have more news as this story develops. Now on to a sobering new projection suggesting the coronavirus is only going to get worse in the U.S. in the coming months. A research model used by the White House suggests the death toll in America could reach 300,000 by the start of December if more people don't wear masks. At this point, the virus has already taken a hefty toll. Nearly 5 million people have been infected, and over 160,000 of those have died. Meanwhile, a major decision for New York children with the pandemic trending in the right direction. Governor Andrew Cuomo has authorized all school districts in the state to reopen in the fall. He says if the infection rate climbs again, the guidance will change accordingly. David Begno reports. We are seeing slow uptick in test positivity in cases. That was the White House Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks. She was talking to state and local officials on a conference call that was obtained by the Center for Public Integrity. Dr. Burks flagged nine U.S. cities as areas of concern for the White House due to high or increasing test positivity rates. The White House is also monitoring California's Central Valley. Hospitalizations and ICU rates in that region are outpacing the rest of the state. Professor Edward Flores of the University of California Merced says the people living there are some of the most vulnerable. Whether it's in agriculture or food packing or uh, transportation or healthcare, um, one out of every three workers here is an essential worker. To Georgia now, where one school, North Paulding High School, is facing national criticism over this photo that shows packed hallways and few students with masks on. School officials suspended the student who shared the photo for five days. And on Wednesday, the principal made this announcement to the school. Anything that's going on social media that is negative in our light without permission, that's like photography, that's video, the same thing, there will be consequences. What did you think of that? I thought that was quite like weird and just like very threatening. That young man is a sophomore who goes to the school. He says he's friends with the student who was suspended, and while he didn't want to share his name with us, he told us he thinks the school overreacted. In the handbook that the school gives us, it does say that you're not allowed to post pictures of the school online and other things like that. However, almost every single student has broken that rule before. Do they require you to wear a mask? No. Are the desks socially distanced in the rooms? No, they are not. The Labor Department has released the latest jobs numbers for the month of July. It shows the U.S. economy added 1.8 million new jobs last month. This signals economic growth despite a surging number of coronavirus cases nationwide. In addition, the unemployment rate has fallen to its lowest point since March at 10.2%. Earlier, my colleague Anne-Marie Green spoke with Francis Stacy of Optimal Capital about what this means for the economy. This is definitely good news and definitely points that we're going in the right direction. I was really pleased to see that a lot of the jobs were added in the leisure and hospitality because, of course, that's the sector of the economy. That, along with restaurants and retail, those added jobs, and it's great because those are the sectors of the economy that were hurt the most. Um, I will mm -hmm. say, unem so unemployment is great. It dropped across the board. It dropped with minorities. It dropped, um, you know, with everyone involved. But we just have to see, and I know I say this every week, and it's, it's kind of hard to hear this, but we just have to see if this trend continues. There, you know, this data kind of comes from the second and third week of July. 
And of course, you had the rest of July where the closures and the reversals on the openings were increasing. And so we'll have to see in the yeah. weekly jobless claims that we watch so carefully, you know, what kind, you know, does that change the curve meaningfully? Meanwhile, the White House and Democrats have still not struck a deal on the next coronavirus stimulus package. Democrats want to restore the $600 weekly unemployment bonus that expired on July 31st. Republicans are hoping to slash the bonus to $200 per week. About 30 million Americans are relying on jobless benefits during this pandemic. CBS News White House correspondent Weijia Zhang has more on the stalled negotiations. We're very far apart. It's, it's most unfortunate. Congressional Democrats and White House negotiators emerged from a three-hour-plus meeting on Capitol Hill with no deal. I would say we're closer on a lot of issues. We're still very far apart on some very significant issues. As some 30 million Americans wait in financial limbo for enhanced unemployment benefits to be restored, each side blamed the other. We could have passed a very... Uh, skinny deal that dealt with some of the most pressing issues. When they said a skinny proposal, it was anorexic. And Democratic leaders said executive action is not a solution. Economic recovery was billed as the theme of President Trump's trip to Ohio Thursday, where the state's governor did not greet him on the tarmac as planned, after testing positive for COVID-19 just hours earlier. We want to wish him the best. He'll be fine. Governor Mike DeWine was first tested with the White House's antigen test that provides results quickly. But later that afternoon, his results were negative after taking a more sensitive test. It prompts questions about the reliability of the one DeWine received from the White House. Weijia Jang, CBS News, the White House. And CBS News White House correspondent Paula Reed is traveling with the president and is in Bridgewater, New Jersey. She joins us now. Hi, Paula. So what is the latest on stimulus negotiations? Could the president use an executive order to pass his priorities? Well, Tanya, we know that Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin are headed back to the Hill today to continue these negotiations. But after two weeks, it does not appear that the two sides have really been able to compromise on anything. They remain trillions of dollars apart. This morning, the House Speaker said that they, they really can't find any common ground in terms of funding for schools to reopen or in terms right now of voting support, money for elections. So the president has escalated his threat to try to do this unilaterally, to do this through executive action. But, Tanya, there are some questions, uh, legal questions, about whether he really can do this just with the stroke of a pen. This is something that's really supposed to be negotiated uh, with Congress, and then the president gets to sign it. But some legal experts have said that they see some wiggle room in some recent Supreme Court cases uh, about immigration, that perhaps the president uh, does have the kind of power to do this. But just because the Supreme Court has authorized uh, some executive action on immigration, that doesn't necessarily mean that the president can do what he wants to do here. Now, he said that if he takes executive action, he'd want to focus on relief uh, for some of the people who are facing possible eviction. He'd also want to potentially do a payroll tax cut and also offer some relief for student loans. Now, there have been some other ideas floated by the White House, but that's what the president says he wants to do. And Tanya, each of those have to be taken independently. For example, eviction relief. Well, what specifically does he want to do? Does he want to just continue the current relief? When it comes to the payroll tax cut, I've talked to uh, White House advisors who are no longer there uh, before these Supreme Court cases ca uh, came down, and they believed Really, the only tax relief that the president could offer unilaterally would be a reduction in capital gains and that he couldn't actually do the payroll tax cut himself, uh, because if he could, he would have. And lastly, when it comes to student loans, he hasn't said specifically what he wants to do. Does he want to follow through on the Republican uh, proposal on student loans, which, Tanya, looks a lot like what's currently on the books. Uh, folks who you pay based on your income, that's not very different uh, than, than the current laws, the current policies. Or does the president want to continue, as the Democrats do, continue really forbearance in payments, meaning people who have these federal student loans don't necessarily need to make payments for a certain period of time? And, Tanya, that's the hardest part of this. They haven't been specific about exactly what they want to do, which makes it very difficult to assess whether the president even would be successful if he tried to do an executive order.
specific there, Paula. Start, spe speaking then of executive orders, the president also issued one last night targeting the parent companies of two popular Chinese-made social media apps, TikTok mm -hmm. and WeChat. What does this executive order do, and is it likely to further strain relations with China? Well, this is certainly an escalation, and this just isn't rhetoric. This is action that the president is taking. There have also been sanctions on, on several high-ranking officials. We're obviously in campaign season right now. This is a very intense campaign for the president, and he campaigned back in 2016 on a promise to get tough on China. But when it comes specifically to this executive action he's taking uh, against TikTok and WeChat, uh, it's hard to really, again, hammer out the details. I've spoken with several White House advisors this morning, and my first question was, OK, uh, if you don't want anyone doing business with these companies, does that include, for example, Apple or one of the other companies that has an app store? Will they get in trouble for, for selling and offering these free apps? Because if it's free, hate to get all like lawyer nerdy on you, Tanya, but technically if it's free, you could argue <laughs> that it's not necessarily commerce. But it appeared that they, they didn't, they hadn't really thought about this. But Tanya, we know we've seen this before, where the administration will push out an executive order to great fanfare. But then when you, when you drill down, uh, sometimes they really haven't crafted it in a way that is sufficiently nuanced to get through the courts. So it is likely that this will face court challenges. I'm told that the president intends to defend this, arguing national security, that he has to do this to protect the personal information of Americans that they argue uh, the Chinese government and this company, which they argue are, are one and the same, um, are using for malicious purposes. But, Tanya, it's more likely that if this goes to the court, we'll see likely the administration has to revise this executive order as they get feedback from the courts on exactly how far the president's powers really extend here. All right. And Paula, the president is escalating his attacks on his presumptive Democratic opponent, Joe Biden, as the election yeah. looms. Now he's targeting the presidential debates. What is the latest on this in his campaign? Well, the president and his campaign, they believe that the debates are really going to be a strength for the president, that it'll be a chance for him to really draw a contrast between himself and the former vice president. And the president uh, has expressed concern that because mail-in uh, balloting, uh, mail-in voting uh, may be available before uh, these debates, he asked if they could either add another debate or move up one of the debates. But that was rejected by the, the Commission on Presidential Debates. Yesterday, the president was in Ohio, and while he was supposed to really focus on manufacturing and jobs, it really sounded, Tanya, a lot like a, a campaign, a campaign stop. He repeatedly attacked Joe Biden. He went after him on his faith. He said, quote, he's against, he, Biden, is against God. He's against guns. He's against energy. The Biden campaign, though, shot back. And in a statement, they said, quote, Donald Trump is the only president in our history to have tear gassed peaceful Americans and thrown a priest out of his church just so he could profane it and a Bible for his own cynical optics. So that's talking about ratcheting up the rhetoric. Uh, it sounds like that's, that's a little preview of what we're going to hear uh, over the next few months as this campaign uh, gets underway. And as we know, the president has continued uh, to lag in the polls and is really appearing to look for any opportunity he can to try to, to keep his base and potentially recruit other supporters. The gloves are coming off. All right. Well, Paula Reed traveling with the president in New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining us. The National Rifle Association is firing back at New York's attorney general one day after Letitia James filed suit to try and shut the NRA down. The New York AG claims the organization's top executives, including CEO Wayne LaPierre, diverted millions of dollars from the group for their own personal use. James's lawsuit alleges senior leaders used millions on trips to the Bahamas, private jets, luxury hotels, and fine dining. But now, the NRA is filing a countersuit against James. The NRA's president released a statement calling the AG's action a, quote, baseless, premeditated attack on our organization and the Second Amendment freedoms it fights to defend. The statement went on to say it's a transparent attempt to score political points and attack the leading voice in opposition to the